So for more insight, we now welcome Benham Ben Tallablu, Senior Fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He joins us from Washington. Good to see you, Benham. Thank you for your time. It's disturbing to think that Russia may be helping Iran develop its nuclear weapons program in exchange for this alleged delivery of ballistic <coughs> missiles Tehran gave Moscow for its war against Ukraine. What is your take on these nuclear concerns voiced by the U.S. and the U.K.? What can you share? Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, and this is certainly an area to watch because as uh, Iran and Russia tightened their military and political and security and intelligence ties, it was more a matter of when, not if, the crown jewel, the nuclear issue, uh, would enter the frame here. But lest we forget, Russia has already been helping the Islamic Republic with its nuclear program. Uh, diplomatically, the Russians were the main interlocutors with the P5 plus one uh, ever since 2021, when the Biden administration has been trying to resurrect the 2015 nuclear deal known as the JCPOA. Uh, even under the auspices of that agreement, the Russians were involved in the underground Fordo facility to allegedly make it uh, you know, a, a more civilian-friendly facility. We know that didn't pan out too well. The Russians pulled out somewhere between 2019 and 2021 there. The Russians are already involved in producing um, uh, or trying to build new light water reactors in the southwest of Iran, and they provide the spent fuel, and they, they provide the fuel, and they take away the spent fuel for Iran's reactor at Bushir. So all of that is a basis, I think, for what Secretary Blinken uh, has been saying about what the future could hold. And my fear is that it's not going to be limited just to this kind of technology. It, my fear is it could be on two fronts. One is on the illicit procurement front, so that the regime can get dual use or WMD relevant technology for its nuclear program. And the second, God forbid, could be on the weaponization front, where uh, Russian nuclear secrets uh, could help Tehran connect the last series of dots as it tries to go for a nuclear weapon uh, as cost-free and as covertly as possible. And this could be anything like research and development, uh, warhead uh, design and miniaturization, uh, you name it. But the problem is, because we don't know right now, this is a gray cloud uh, that is hanging over uh, uh, America's ability to thwart Russia and Iran's deepening military ties. A distressing grey cloud indeed. Given exactly what you're outlining, what can the West do here? Sanctions <clears throat> don't seem to be making that much of an impact. Iran is obviously denying sending any weapons to Russia for use against Ukraine, and it's vowing to respond to the latest round of sanctions from the West, which it's calling a failed tool. So what next? Well, there needs to be a heck of a lot next and soon. Uh, Russia is poised to be uh, Iran's lawyer on the U.N. Security Council from here on out, unless the West, particularly Washington and its transatlantic partners, works to snap back and restore the international legal baseline for pressure against the Islamic Republic. Once you have that baseline restored, you can create a wider net for political and uh, economic pressure against the Islamic Republic to have a wider net to catch the places that its agents go shopping to get the capabilities and the technologies and the components uh, it needs for its nuclear program. Beyond that, of course, you need to have a change in philosophy in Washington to actually embrace a pressure policy, one that escalates sanctions pressure as the threat escalates. That means cracking down on oil shipments and petrochemicals. And then in all of the jurisdictions that Tehran is sending drones and missiles and all these other projectiles to, Washington needs to make sure that those uh, forces on the ground that are the recipients or on the are on the ends of uh, uh, of these weapons, whether the Ukrainians or the Israelis have all they need to defend themselves. That means more in terms of air and missile defense, as well as what they can to offset and counter these systems. And that does mean longer range strike capabilities, particularly uh, for the Ukrainians. And talking about the developments here. In the Middle East, Iran has yet to conduct its vowed direct <clears throat> strike on Israel following that assassination of Hamas leader Ismail Khania in Tehran in recent months, a humiliating elimination in the Iranian capital, of course, blamed on Israel. Iranian proxies are active, the Houthis, as recently as this morning. What do you make of the strategy Iran is employing, waiting and waiting while its proxies do the work, so to speak? Uh, indeed, its proxies are doing the work. I, I have a slightly different take than this than some friends and colleagues uh, here in Washington, which is that while as devastating and as humiliating uh, as the killing of Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran was, the non-response is more born out of a sense of success in Tehran than a sense of fear. As we get closer and closer to the one-year anniversary uh, of the 10-7 terrorist attacks, 
Uh, the regime is seeing things in the region go its way. Saudi-Israeli normalization is delayed. There is now a massive chasm between the Arab street and the Arab state. Uh, America is having a harder time connecting the dots in the Middle East. Iran is benefiting from greater uh, great power uh, coverage, be it economically from the Chinese and politically and militarily, and as we discussed earlier, potentially nuclearly uh, from the Russians. Uh, so things are going its way, and it would not necessarily behoove the Islamic Republic to try to uh, save face and then lose its head. So I fear that the non-response is driven more by a sense of strategy than by a sense of successful deterrence. That doesn't discount the role of American deterrence, which has been significant in the month of August, or the role of Israeli deterrence in the same time. But Iran is merely threatening a wider war to be able to prey on America's fears of restraint. And that fear of restraint, as you sense uh, in Israel, is coming down on Israel like a ton of bricks to force a ceasefire and to force the ceasefire on them between the war aims that are actually met. Always appreciate your insights. Thank you so much, Ben and Ben Teleblue, live from Thank Washington. You. Thank you.